There. Did everything. <laughs> is it working? Is it stable? Is the internet, am I, am I chopping up here? It's okay for now. It's working all right? Okay. So where's my Google Fiber? Google, when are you going to install Google Fiber here on Vancouver Island? That would be lovely. We need to all move to Kansas City. Yeah. Well, or now Austin. I mean, that would be better. Move oh, my Austin. gosh. I didn't <clears> realize great. they were doing it there. Yeah, in Austin and in uh, Salt Lake City, I think. Yeah, I'm not moving to Salt Lake City. No. Austin, I could deal Austin, with. Austin, I could do. Yeah, exactly. We're, come, we're moving to Austin, bringing the show to Austin. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, we're going to record a live episode of Astronomy Cast, and you're going to watch. And hopefully, <laughs> the actual episode of Astronomy Cast is going to be more smooth than the preparation for the episode of Astronomy Cast, which has been a bit of a gong show so far. So Blame Canada. It was your Canadian it internet my, that did this. Yeah, it's been kind of glitchy, and I think a nice hard reboot on both the uh, the cable modem and my router seem to have fixed it. So now I'm getting 50 megs down. So it's good. It's good. Um, I hope that going up keeps going up. <laughs> so for anyone who's watching this and they've never done this before, what we're going to do, we take about half an hour to record the live episode. And uh, in this case, we're doing uh, the Mir space station. When we're done that, we will uh, sort of stick around. We'll sort of save our recording, so don't go anywhere. And then we will stick around, and we will answer your questions about space and astronomy for 15 minutes or so, uh, depending on how much time Pamela has, how much time I have. Um, uh, how, how are you doing with the pollen? I'm, I'm oh, totally I'm, stuffed I'm, up. My, my finger is hovering over the mute button so that I can continually sniffle but not sniffle yeah. into my microphone. There are fields and fields and fields of gorgeous, stunning, sinus-clogging, migraine-causing pollen. Oh. Making yeah. flowers. Yeah, it's I have bad. pictures on on Google Plus. They're very yeah, I saw your pictures. They were lovely. Yeah. Um, and did you see the new Doodle, the new Google Doodle, the one for Earth Day? No, I had no. It's yet. really neat. It's kind of it's got a, like a day night scene, and and it's got the sun and the moon and prairie dogs and and stuff. It's quite cute, but it has a little bit of an astronomical inaccuracy. So when the moon goes by, you can it's the crescent moon. And you can you can see the stars go through the part through the part that should be a, a ball. Yeah. Oh no. The moon moves and the stars don't move, right? So the moon moves past the stars. So yeah. So Phil wrote a a delightful and very soft takedown on it. So if you uh, if you want to check that out, check out Phil's plate over on Slate.com. Uh, Bad astronomy. He's. Uh, he sort of goes through all of the problems with the doodle. So, yeah, they tried. The clouds aren't moving. No, the clouds aren't moving, which obviously clouds should move. And the, But, no, I think the... The, <laughs> the moon is... That's the, so wrong. I know, I know. And the moon's orientation <laughs> is wrong, and the moon's going in the wrong... You know, and the, and the, the phase of the moon, it's a, it's a it's crescent moon, backwards. so it should follow... It should, it's backwards. It should follow the sun... You know, if the if it's a crescent moon, the sun should be down, and, and then the moon and should be it, orbiting and, like this. Uh, the moon doesn't do. It. Okay, I, sorry. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But it's adorable. We love you, Google. But yeah. wow, that's wrong. <clears throat> it's so wrong. Yeah, it's wrong on so many levels. So anyway, um, if people want to check that out, uh, I'm gonna pull, bring up the. Uh, I'm gonna bring this up. I if I can. I yeah, if, I can bring it up if you can't. Can you? Yeah. And share it. Just a second. Yeah, just a second. Okay. Sorry, everybody. So while Pamela is doing that, I will sort of explain how this works. Uh, so you can. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay, good. I'll, I'll share Here, that. I'll zoom in on it. I will try. And can you zoom restart in on it? It it's it it constantly recycles itself. Yeah, but I don't know if you can start from the beginning. So you see, the moon is going the wrong way. Uh, the stars aren't moving when they should be moving with the moon. The moon should move a little faster than the stars, but the stars should be. The clouds aren't moving. Um, and and it has the crescent moon up at night. It yeah. it has the sun and the moon always out of sync with one another. Yeah. No, and the the moon can be like right snuggled up next to the sun in the sky, and yeah. the clouds aren't moving at all. But who cares? Let, let the meteorologists worry about that. Not I have problem. to Let's... say, I do like the prairie dog holes. Yeah, 
Yep. I'm a and, fan of the prairie dog holes. And the, the little and moved. the little fish swimming around. Yeah. So now, now the moon but looks the great. The rise it's, in set time isn't changing. It's just right. the phase that is changing. Yes, and it's going in. You know, it's, it's moving in front of the stars, which it shouldn't be doing. Why? Well, it, it would kind of be doing that, but not that fast. It should be. You know, the stars should be moving at night. The stars move at the moon. Anyway, you all know this. You watch Astronomy Cast. You know what we're talking about. I am a fan of the prairie dogs. You you there have you to find a good thing to say. I'm yep. a fan of the prairie dogs. Wow, okay. If you hover over it, you can like radically change. I don't know what I just changed. Wow. Season. It's now dead winter. Right. And the sun should be a little uh, lower in the sky. But anyway, again, we are not giving them a hard time with this. Thanks, Chris. We're simply All right. delighted and amused with how bad this is. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, Eric Charlin is saying on YouTube that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson could make the change in Titanic, then maybe Phil can uh, can do a takedown. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Don't watch it anymore. It's just gonna, it's just gonna make you frustrated. I, 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 I'm simply in awe. It's like when you get that that paper turned in where the student says that the parsec is the width of a piece of paper held at arm's length, and you're like, no. That's so bad, it's awesome. This is so bad, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, you can <clears throat> you can comment on this uh, episode while we do the show. Uh, there's a bunch of places you can do that. You can you can comment on uh, on the event page on Google Plus. You can comment on uh, Twitter. Just use the hashtag AstronomyCast. Uh, if you're watching this sort of somewhere on Google+, Plus, you can just post in the stream and it should come back. But the safest place is to make a post over on YouTube. And, uh, yeah, and so you'll want to, you know, if you're not sure that we're seeing your questions or comments, that's probably because we aren't. And the place that we will absolutely see them is over on uh, on YouTube. So um, are you ready to record? Yes, and I now have this terrible desire as soon as we're off air to go program one of these that works accurately. Do you want to do that right now? We can wait. No, okay. no. It it will probably take me about five hours. All right. Oh. Um. Okay. I'm ready to record. Um. I lost my window. There's my window. Oh, I lost my introduction. That's weird. Okay. Okay. Say what? I am looking for the record button. I am pressing the record button. Have you not discovered where the record button is? Okay. Is it mono? Yes. All right. I am also recording. All right, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 297 for Monday, March 11th, 2013. Space Stations, part two, Mir. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Evansville. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Uh, good, good. A little stuffed up, a little bit of a head cold, chest cold thing going on, and I know you're suffering from your seasonal allergies. Yeah, and the seasonal allergies like to cause other things to get to grow with the pollen in the sinuses. It's so charming. Yeah, so it's beautiful, but you don't want to go out and no. check it out because it's just going to attack you with its, it's death. quality goodness. It's death from the plants instead of death from the skies. Death from the plants. Triffids. Yeah. Um, all right, so we've got any any interesting announcements? Are we still do we still have any openings for the uh, for people looking to join yes. our astronomy so classes? So there are, and this only pertains to the people who are watching it live. There are five more hours to sign up for the few remaining oh, really? spots okay. in um, in our cosmology class. So go to cosmoquest.org/classes to learn more, and we will be repeating that later on so go express your interest in email if you want to sign up for a later date and uh and dr mr francis uh he the joined us on uh, i guess he's the uh the bowler hat astronomer yes yeah but he joined us on uh the weekly space hangout on friday and uh sort of got to tackle the big updates to dark matter the dis potential discovery of dark matter and yes. it, it's great he did a great job so he's he's definitely got his cosmology chops and particle physics chops so I think he's writing really the book talk. on it. So he wrote the book on it. 
Um, okay, great. Well, let's get rolling then. Uh, so, last week we introduced the history of space stations and focused on the U.S. and Soviet stations that were launched after the Apollo era. This week we look at one of the longest running missions ever launched, Mir. From its launch to construction to its fiery finale, Mir helped both the Russians and the Americans extend their understanding of what it actually takes to live in space. So, we are now moving from my childhood to my professional career in sort of the history here, in that, you know, I can remember Mir, I guess I wasn't a child, I guess I was sort of in my early 20s when Mir launched, but I actually was there reporting on sort of some of the later missions and its what final... What year do you think it launched? Didn't it launch in the, in the 80s? 86. Yeah, was, 86, okay, yeah, so no, I was still a child, I was, I was yeah. a teenager, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's and like then not that much older. right. I'm not that much older. No, no. And then, but but amazingly, right. So I was, yeah, that's right. I was a teenager when it launched, and there was missions, and then, but then I had become an astronomy journalist by the time it was ready to deorbit it in the early '90s. So this this was a very long lived. It it. Sorry, in the 2000s. Sorry, in the early yeah. 2000s. Man, I cannot get my numbers straight. <clears throat> It's, yeah. it's, it's that kind of a Monday. Um, yeah, this was a really long-lived mission. It, it went from 1986 to, uh, it came thundering down through the atmosphere in 2001. Um, and along the way, it, it survived the downfall of the Soviet Union. Uh, it transferred hands from the, the Soviet space program to the Russian space program. Uh, it went from being a Cold War platform to one that was uh, visited by multiple nations, including converting a docking port originally designed for the Soviet space plane Buran into one that allowed the U.S. space shuttle to, to um, happily dock with, with Mir. It... Yeah, this was one heck of a mission. So let's go back then and sort of begin at the beginning. Uh, sort of when did, what was sort of, what led up to Mir and what sort of began that as the next big space station? Because when last we saw our heroes, uh, there was the, uh, the U.S. Sky Lab and there was the Salyut stations. Yeah. But Mir was a whole other sort of order of magnitude in sort of, size, complexity, weight, and the kinds of missions they were going to be doing. So it, it gets talked about as a third generation space, space station and the ISS is also a third generation space station. These are first generation are things that get launched, they stay in space, you use them with one crew and then they're dead. Uh, second generation were single launch, one module space stations like the Salyut series towards the end that crews came and went and it got restocked and it was a, a long-lived maintained platform to live on in space. These third generation space stations, they went to the next step and they were constructed out of multiple modules and constructed on orbit, uh, allowing uh, basically updates, new experiments, and, and a growth platform that, that as money allowed, they could continue to grow this, this system they had um, kind of like an advanced Lego block system built on orbit. So how many pieces does it have? Um, a lot. So do you want to look up it, that it, answer it's, before you? Well, no, I'm I'm actually going to hold my ground on that. So, okay. Right. So it gets it gets complicated to ask how many pieces does it have because there's all of the main modules that it had that that are the things that human beings can move through. Then there's the things that got mounted on it that people couldn't go into. Then there's the experiments that came and went over time, and so, in general, while it's fair to say that this was basically um, a, a medi-armed monster, a six-armed monster that had uh, eight major components with all of the different things coming off the sides, I, I don't think you can simply say it had this many pieces because it was used just like any laboratory um, a variety of different ways over the course of its lifetime with experiments that were mounted on the inside coming and don't going over time. But the construction would feel very familiar to what's been happening with the International Space Station, right? It was built in pieces. And, and it, 
what's kind of awesome is unlike the International Space Station that has this careful symmetry, careful floor planning, this really looks like a kid basically took a whole bunch of different toy spacecraft and crammed them together to see what it could get. Um, where the International Space Station has its main banks of solar arrays, with, with the Soviet NIR, each component had it, its own solar arrays, its own photo, photovoltaic systems. Uh, so each module in, in many ways was self-sufficient. Um, there, there were a few exceptions to that. The docking module was powered by the rest of the space station. Um, but more or less, these are a bunch of individual multiple generations of technology pieces that just repeatedly got plugged together over time. Yeah, and it's quite a, it's quite amazing how sort of how I guess how many they put into this, how many of these pieces are, how many each one was sort of self-reliant and and sort of how they constructed this thing. Have you have you ever read I think it was called Dragonfly? It's a it's a book about the Mir space station and goes into some of the it's done from the point of view of a he was a, he was a British astronaut working but with NASA and talks about the crazy stuff that happened near the near the end of it. I mean, by the time it was nearing the end of its life as you know, we had sort of hinted at this last week, it was turning into a pretty nasty place to live. Yeah, they they'd had a couple of different fires. In, in one case, the the fire was was actually a little bit more adventuresome than one would want. This this occurred while they were in the process of swapping out crews. So instead of only having three people on board, which is the standard crew for Mir, they had six people on board, but they only had respirator systems for three. And because they are in the process of, of unloading and, remo and redoing things and stuff, there were hoses in the way of being able to get to one of the Soyuz escape pot modules. And had they not been able to get the fire under control, and the fire extinguishers were like attached to the wall, they couldn't pull them off and like take them to the fire. Um, but if they hadn't gotten the fire under control, they would have definitely lost at least three people, if not everybody. Um, and there was a time when one of the progress supply craft crashed into it. it. It got crashed into. There was another case where one was trying to dock and it couldn't quite dock. And during a spacewalk to figure out what the heck was going on, they discovered a loose bag of garbage that had somehow <laughs> escaped into space and was blocking the docking hatch. Um, that that's like the crazy. Why won't my garage, my automatic garage door close? And you realize that there's like an empty McDonald's can. Um, right. Except this is a space spaceship. Yeah. Well, they 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 use a, if I recall correctly, the Russians, the Soviets used this automated docking system, while the Americans would always dock manually. Right. And they had this camera system, so they could sort of see the the, the Soviets had set it all up so it would all automatically dock. As you can imagine, the docking attempting to happen and then bumping into the garbage. <laughs> um, <laughs> a Roomba gone wrong is, yeah, is all that's yeah. coming. <laughs> to my mind. But, but before we get into the sort of the, the later stages and the kind of where things started to go a little, you know, it got a little long awry. in the tooth. Awry. A little long in the tooth. Um, but let's talk about some of the sort of some of the records because this was, I know, before the International Space Station, this was the largest thing that had ever been orbited around the Earth. I mean, and, and up until 2010, it was the longest manned thing or womaned thing, human thing in space. And it accomplished vast amounts of science. Um, one of the things in its construction that, that made me particularly pleased is with the International Space Station, we started from scratch. We built everything from scratch. Well, the, the Russians don't work that way. The Soviets didn't work that way. And so while they were in the process of building it, they actually went over to the last Salyut that was still in orbit, and they grabbed all of the science experiments off of it and took them over to Mir so they could keep doing the science. They took the scientific instruments, brought them over. They had an entire compartment crystal that was dedicated to biochemistry experiments, including microgravity chemistry to grow crystals in space, thus the name. Um, so this was a platform designed pretty much from the ground up as a science platform. That's why it was there. And along the way, they did all these inadvertent experiments on what happens when you stick people in space for too long and trap them there. 
Um, so it, it was kind of amazing both the purposefully broken records and the accidentally broken records that occurred. So, so what were some of the purposefully broken records that they were going for? Longest human space flight, obviously. Yeah, clearly. Longest human space flight, uh, longest space flight manned by humans, uh, highest number of people in space at one time, um, all the basics, longest spacewalk, most spacewalks in the shortest period of time, all of those things, one after another, were getting broken. Um, now, you said some, some sort of unexpected records that they broke. And yes. I think, I, I think my favorite story, mostly because I, I was living my own version of it in a way, I, I went to the Soviet Union in 1991, leaving America on the day of the first desert war, desert war, desert storm war started and returned to America two weeks before the Soviet coup and so I was there watching the restlessness occur and had one of these I probably need to leave now type of thoughts going through my head. I was just a high school kid on a foreign exchange program and so when the Soviet coup occurred I was watching it very closely and one of the stories that caught my attention was the story of cosmonaut third class Sergei uh, Krikalev and this, this poor guy, he's up in space orbiting on the, the Mir space station and um, they, they didn't have the money to launch a rescue mission to bring him back right. and, and so he's up there, uh, economic disputes are going on and fragmentation of the Soviet Union is taking place where he's supposed to land is no longer part of the Soviet bloc it's now its own independent country um, and and eventually they they were able to bring it back uh, bring him back um, but yeah he he was up there for longer than he anticipated and there are many interesting uh, news article titles about uh, stranded cosmonaut uh, the man who no longer wanted to fly um, and, and can you imagine the situation of you go into space hero of your nation you come back having that nation no longer exists, land into a nation that didn't exist when you took off, and now you're a citizen of a country that, that also didn't exist when you took off. Right. And so he was up there, I th is this right? It was, it was Valery Polakayev, right? He was up there for 437 days. Is that the one? This is actually Sergei uh, Krakalev. Oh, oh, okay, he was up okay. there for 313 days. Yeah. Um, so he wasn't the record holder, but the he record, was up yeah. there much longer than he intended to be. Right. Because typically I know their missions originally were, were, they wanted them to be up around six months or so. So they didn't yeah. know what was going to happen to the astronauts beyond a certain point. And being up in space in that microgravity really wears down the body and really, you know, you lose a lot of your bone mass. Mm -hmm. You know, it's and, not... And when Sergei got back, he had to be supported by soldiers and he was very dizzy. There were health side effects. Um, so it was a kind of mystifying situation, psychologically damaging situation, and not particularly healthy for your bones situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you get extra radiation. But then, as I mentioned, then the, the longest here is 437 days yeah. by Valery Polakov, which and, is and that was crazy. More on purpose. That was the plan, was 430 days. Like, let's push this to the outer limits. Yeah. So there, there were some more challenging and less challenging. I, I think one of my favorite stories of, of the different crews that went up, though, was probably Shannon um, Lucid. She was an astronaut, one of the early women astronauts selected by NASA. She's been, she was an astronaut starting in the late 70s. Uh, she flew multiple times during the space shuttle program. And then for a long time, she held the U.S. record for the largest number of days of a U.S. person in space. Um, and this was, she, she took off in 1996 uh, aboard space, space Shuttle Atlantis and um, ended up in space for over 180 days with 
um, to cosmonauts that apparently spent most of the flight bickering with one another. So according to stories that you hear when you get people at NASA at the correct level of either exhausted or slightly intoxicated, you hear about how she spent most of her flight basically you go to that corner, you go to that corner uh, while running her biochemistry <laughs> experiments. Right. And trying. And kind of an awesome, awesome reality happens in space. We may call these people heroes, but they're also humans. And and you were mentioning about, you know, that she was a NASA astronaut, that, that NASA got involved in the Mir game pretty heavily and sent several missions with the space shuttle Atlantis. They modified Mir to be able to dock with Atlantis. It was a it was actually quite a great era of cooperation. It, it really was. There, there was a period here in the U.S. where rather than building our own space station, we, we gave good hard thought to, well, what would it take to just keep adapting and keep flying Mir? Now, on, on one level, there is the problem that Mir was just kind of dirty, smelly, awful. But, of course, now the ISS is too, so who's talk? Um, but on the other hand, there there's just problems with, because of the way it was built, it gets a lot of drag, uh, it had to constantly be boosted to higher orbits. Um, and then with the fires, the crashing of the progress and things, it was just getting a little bit beat up. So eventually, the idea of keeping near was abandoned. But in the process of leading up to the do we keep or do we ditch Mir, um, there was this, this new cooperation that began in 1994. So the Soviet coup occurred summer of 1991. That was when Yeltsin took over. That was when it became Russia instead of the Soviet Union. And you saw the collapse of the Soviet bloc with Lithuania, Estonia, uh, Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan, I'm going to mangle that one. Many of the Soviet bloc nations became independent countries. 1994, the United States and the new Russian Republic uh, began feeling one another out to do joint missions with phase one of this being the space shuttle discovery um, going on, on a mission that included cosmonaut Sergei Krakalev. Um, in 1995, uh, the space shuttle went to Mir. As I said, they, they reconfigured a docking port that was originally designed for the um, never really flown to space Buran space plane. Uh, they, they put that into play for the space shuttle instead. And then we kept doing missions year after year after year, um, all the way through the 90s. Um, in, in the 2000s, that was when the program started to wind down due to um, safety concerns and also because the, the scientific return after the Spectre science model failed to, to make it. Um, it just wasn't what had been anticipated. And MIR was a science platform. So that pretty much brought an end to the program. There was talk for a while um, of, of selling Mir, which I find to be just awesome, uh, but but in in the end that didn't happen either. It, it almost happened, but um, now, and I think, but I think one of the things that, that really is interesting is how now, when you look at the International Space Station crews, especially right at the beginning, there was like one Russian and two Americans, or one American and two Russians, that there was really this emphasis. And for a big chunk of the 90s, Americans were learning Russian. They were going to Russia. They were training at Star City. That there was this, you, yeah, that you did? Um, well, I, I didn't, didn't train. Do, I, I learned Russian and I worked with yeah. Soviet scientists because in the early 90s, we were all recognizing that even while the Cold War was going on, that it's these two nations that are going to have the greatest scientific return. Uh, it, a British scientist I work with, uh, Jake Nolster, he was part of a program in England that sent some of their top students to train at Star City. And it, it, it was recognized this is the direction we have to go. And I, I think astronomers are more likely to speak bad Russian than they are to speak any other foreign language. Yeah, and and I and again, I think this is in Dragonfly. Just talking about this training, because a lot of the times, these you know, these were the, your corn-fed 
American astronauts, right, who have been, you know, haven't learned a lick of Russian, although in many cases they're super geniuses. So, so they go over there and, and then they spend this time training and learning the language and going through a battery of medical tests to be able to serve on a Russian space station. I mean, it was such a, it, when you just think about how the Cold War was like still kind of going on or had just ended and already these plans of collaboration were in the works. I think it was a pretty interesting thing that, that happened. And, and by the late 90s, it was recognized that if you were going to apply for the U.S. astronaut program, you had to be fluent in Russian. And, and so it was interesting talking with people. We had some at the University of Texas who were applying for the astronaut corps. Um, they spoke fluent Russian. They had their EMT certification. They were pilots. They were scientists. Uh, you had to check every box to have a chance of being selected, let alone even just becoming a finalist. You had to have all those boxes checked. Just another, I guess, another way that astronauts are incredible human beings because they, oh, yeah, sure, I'll learn Russian. If I give me enough time, I'll learn Russian. Yeah. It's yeah. easier than learning English, to be honest. Oh, is it? You've, you've yeah. gone through it. Um, uh, okay, so so I think I'd like to focus a bit just on some of those disasters because there were a couple of events that were quite scary that happened with, with Mir. The one was the fire, and you sort of went into this a bit, but can you kind of give the story of what happened with that fire? Um, fires happen. I'm not sure what else to, to say on this one. So uh, they had a, a malfunction of one of their solid fuel oxygen generators, and and oxygen's kind of a little bit flammable. Actually, it's what's required for fire to happen. Yeah. Um, and and so this this fire burned for depending on on exactly uh, which source you read, anywhere from a couple of minutes to almost fifteen minutes. And the problem with with this is you can't open the windows to get fresh air in when you're yes. in the space station. And, and so they ran into problems with the respirators being broken that they were using to try and be able to survive on board. They, they thought for a little while, I remember this um, when I was in college, they thought for a little while they might have to uh, abandon the, the space station. And so that was a bit of a problem. Um, they were able to, to pull it out, they were able to um, survive it, but there, as I said, there were a number of problems from, from their escape vessel being blocked to broken respirators, and yeah, it was just kind of awful. Right, so I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to read a little chunk here, so uh, that it was, um, uh, the Vi it was the Vika so, so the on Mir they have these these uh, this thing called the electron, which was a oxygen generation system, but it was breaking down all the time. And so they went to yeah. this other these they had these sort of like these solid pods that they could use that could generate with this Vika system that would generate oxygen for the for the station. And the thing you know, and so this thing was a little more a little more dangerous because it was pumping out this this oxygen. Um, and so uh, they you know the official report was the fire burned for about uh, ninety about 90 seconds, but so Jerry Lininger, this is the guy who wrote this book, Dragonfly, he said it went on for about 14 minutes, produced tons of toxic smoke, they couldn't clear, uh, the crew had to put on respirators, but they, but they, the masks, some of the masks were broken, and so they were looking around for, for respirators that worked, and so it was just, um, oh, and the uh, fire extinguishers mounted on the walls couldn't be moved, so it was just, you know, Fire is the big danger on these space stations. And, and, and this fire was triggered by getting hit with progress. And, and so when you get hit by another space station and you catch on fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a bad day. Yeah. And, so, and that's the other part, right, which is that there was sort of the docking accidents that you mentioned with the progress and with the, uh, yeah. um, with the, <laughs> the garbage. Yeah. Um, so, you know, now... You mentioned as well that that the you know that Mir's orbit was degrading. It was having harder and harder times boosting its orbit up. So it was time to you know it was getting old and kind of and scary the Russian inside. Economy didn't and the exist. Russian economy, yeah, wasn't ready to keep it going. So there was 
there was a plan to maybe buy it out, but there was also a plan to deorbit it. So, do you remember anything about that plan to, to buy it so, out? So, so there there's a variety of different plans. There was a Japanese television station. There was an American television station. There were actually commercials projected onto the outside of the space station, um, and and all of these different things appeared in different magazines at different points. Um, but, but at the end of the day, when each of these organizations looked at not only what is the cost of maintaining Mir, which itself wasn't that bad, but then getting people to and from, that was where a lot more of the cost came from. Um, it, it simply it was unfeasible for everybody. The, the U.S. doesn't do that sort of, there, there's no way America is going to fly or was going to fly in the space shuttle uh, Japanese television crews up to the former Russian space station to do reality TV from orbit. Uh, the Soviet turned Russian fledgling new baby space agency uh, how do you trust them to be able to keep going after they've periodically abandoned their own humans in space? So the risk was too high at that point for any commercial agency to uh, take this on basically as an entertainment platform, which was what it was being looked at for. Yeah, and so the problem with the space station, it, you know, as we mentioned, it was the largest thing that had ever been orbited. Uh, we had seen from Skylab that these things could easily survive reentry, and it was going to crash somewhere. Well, so so the nice difference between this vehicle and and Space Lab, Skylab rather, is Skylab was a chunk, oh, single module, extremely dense. Lots of things capable of surviving reentry, and because it was a single chunk of spacecraft, as it comes through, depending on if they can't get it tilted just right, it can survive longer because it's not getting as much drag. Clearly, if you have a giant spiky thing, which is pretty much what Mir was, a giant spiky thing, as it comes through the atmosphere, it experiences a great deal more drag great deal more drag is going to break it apart at a higher altitude and is going to cause it to burn up a lot more. It also wasn't as dense on average as, as Skylab was. So it had a lot of things going in its favor for um, not potentially destroying a city when it decided to hit the planet. Um, they had more control over it. They spent a, a great deal of time after they took all of the last crews off. Um, they sent a progress craft up, which is one of their, we still use progresses, we just use more modern ones. Uh, they sent up a modified progress capsule that instead of being filled with supplies was filled with fuel that they could use to essentially steer it, slow its orbit, and have a very controlled re-entry. Yeah. Uh, it, it ended up disintegrating and coming down around the area of Fuji, a nice big empty Pacific Ocean basically. And I remember there was uh, flights you could take to go out out into the South Pacific and try and and sort of follow the trail of the of it as it was crashing because because yeah. as you said you know they had because they had that progress on board they had really good control over where yeah. they were going to crash it down and they crashed it in the South Pacific away from from everything but they they kind of knew what was going on and knew what was going to happen which is very different from you know when we have these these space telescopes and such that have no way of, of re-entering, you know, safely. And they just, you know, there's a chance it might hit a person. But this one, you know, they knew they knew they could minimize that chance. And I think that's part of why they, they deorbited it when they did, was just like, let's make let's wrap this up safely as opposed to, you know. Let's not drag it out also. That was yeah. I mean one of the things is at this point both nations were looking at building the International Space Station. And yeah. uh, as they were looking towards building that, they needed to free up the funding that was going to tracking Mir, to making sure that Mir's orbit was stable, to uh, making sure it didn't collide violently with various space junk and other things in orbit. Uh, so a lot of effort, which translates into a lot of salary, was going into maintaining Mir, and they needed to free that up to go on to build newer things. Right. So there's definitely some political stuff going on as well. 
Cool. Okay, so this is part two. Uh, next week we're going to talk. We're going to jump into the modern age, and we're going to talk about the International Space Station and a bit about the T the Chinese Tiangong Station, and then maybe if we're feeling uh, you know up for it, we'll do a fourth part of this trilogy and talk about the future of space stations. So, cool. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. My, my pleasure. Okay, don't go away. We're just saving. <clears throat> Uh, Eric Charlin says, uh, I can't believe they haven't made a movie about it. I know. Wouldn't that be great? Either something realistic, like a realistic movie about being on on Mir, or, you know, like a, you know, a rom-com with, <laughs> with the American no. astronaut, uh, you know, in between, uh, you know, trying to settle the score between two battling Russians. So um, <clears throat> let me save mine here. So go ahead and queue up any questions if you have about this or just anything in space and astronomy. And then we will just unleash them on Pamela. And I will sniffle out answers in my hay oh. fever Latin brain. So uh, Michael Yobin, Yobin asks, I can't find about why, but is there a reason why women were on Mir, but now Russia doesn't, and now Russia on INS, ISS, nada? So I guess, are there not Russian, female Russian astronauts on the International Space Station? Um, I don't know. I have I to admit, know. I hadn't looked at the nationalities of the genders. Mm -hmm. Let me see what I can find out. Yeah. Watch us Google in real time. Dance puppets dance. Oh well, one of us can look this up. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the I mean, the Russians have never been shy about sending women into space. They. You know, but I don't know whether, I mean, are they trying to break records or do they just, um, you know, now that it's, now it's ISS, I'm not sure. Uh, Eric Charlin asks, how many non-Russian stayed on Mir? Oh, a lot. A lot, there, yeah. There was, there was like 32 different nations, I want to say, or 32 people from other nations. Yeah, I think it was 12 nations, 160 people were on the, yeah, 100 and... 12 nations, and I don't know the total number of people, but like a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so let's see, we've got it's people from, yeah, so we've got people from Syria, Bulgaria, Afghanistan, France, UK, Austria, Germany, Slovakia, so there was, there was, Tons of people from tons of countries. Yeah. Yeah. Jobin. Jobin. Michael Jobin. Okay. All right. Now I got it. Jobin. Um, how far... Okay. Josh Andrews wants to know, how far outside her own field can Pamela go and still grasp the research literature? Pamela. Uh, it depends. I have random pockets of esoteric knowledge outside of astronomy. Um, <clears throat> So, for sure, but I mean, in astronomy, I mean, like, you're, you're, what is, like, for people who don't know, what is your exact specialty? If they were to, to you know, like, variable stars, extragalactic. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I split my brain in half. Uh, all of my research up through my master's thesis was all on variable stars. Um, as part of my master's thesis, I started studying uh, dwarf seroidal galaxies because of their variable star populations and got into the galaxies. Uh, I had it kindly pointed out to me by faculty that there is no future in variable stars if you want funding. Uh, so for my PhD, I switched over to galaxy cluster research. 
And so uh, research-wise, I'm kind of bimodal, either pulsating variable stars or extragalactic astronomy uh, observational, looking at, at galaxies in a variety of different scenarios. Um, I don't do theory well. If you want me to evaluate whether or not someone's um, observations took into consideration things they need, I'm probably okay. It's it all depends on what needs to be looked right. at. But for example, uh, if you were going to do something on particle physics, like you know, if you were like looking through, I don't know, astro pH and looking at, I can read the know, papers and mostly understand if they're not theory papers uh, what's going on where I start to get into trouble is I'm really not qualified to evaluate the validity of, of papers that are too far out of my field right and you know if you people spend any time looking at papers and you know I do that too um, yeah. for reporting you know there's there's paragraphs of words and then there's a wall of math and so if you you know if it's, your, if it's your field and you know all the equations and you can follow along then then I think that's what in many cases what what understanding those papers is really about is like are they right or are they wrong I can get the gist you can get the gist of it but are you actually sort of equipped with the mathematical equations to actually well, follow along? Right? It, it's not just that. It's it's so if I'm reading an observational astronomy paper, I can go. Did they remember to take into account reddening? Did they remember to take into account this? Did they statistically correct for that? So I I know what are the caveats that you have to worry about in observational astronomy because they're caveats I've had to worry about. In theory papers, I, I don't have a handle of what are the special corrections that you need to remember to make. What are I, I just don't know those things because I'm not a theorist. I use theory that has made it through peer review where people who do know all of those things have signed off on something being correct and I'll read the literature I need to understand a group of papers. Um, so, so we all have to trust the peer review system at a certain level to say these people are experts, they will validate whether this is correct or not. And I think all of us at one point or another have called someone up and said, hey, I'm looking at this paper. It's published in, I don't know, astrophysics. Uh, it looks kind of squirrely. Can you give me an evaluation of it? Because things do get published periodically that should not be. And and so we all have our Rolodex of people we use to to check ourselves. Yeah, and I guess it's just it, it's in sort of levels of understanding. If it's exactly in your field, you can go through a paper and be able to to sort of follow along. If it's outside of your field, you understand some of the core concepts. And and if someone said something really non scientific, you would catch it. And yeah. then there's certain points where you know someone is talking about a very esoteric field like string theory, and then making these mathematical claims, I mean, at a certain point, I'm sure you just kind of go, this is outside yeah. of my world, <laughs> right? Yes. But what about in, but then, I, you know, does the, does the process of, of being able to read scientific papers help you with other stuff? If you sat down and read a biology paper or a geology paper or a, you know well, what I mean? I, the, the, that's what I meant by random pockets of esoteric knowledge. Um, so I, for instance, if I sit down and try and read a lunar paper on mineralogy, I'm lost. It is, it is all a lot of really complicated multisyllabic words that sometimes refer to, th to, to things that I have no idea why it's important. Um, but at the same time, because I'm personally interested in animal behavior and have chosen when those papers come up in science or nature to read a lot of those papers and I've read, yeah. read a few books on it as a hobby I can randomly read papers on animal behavior and make sense of it yeah. or I've I've had random moments of reading drug studies or epidemiology because I heard something on the news that didn't make sense um, so I think all of us simply by choosing to read can develop pockets of content knowledge well outside of our field. Epidemiology yeah. is a study of statistics. I mean, I had found it very intimidating in the beginning, and now, you know, depending on, on the kinds of papers, I can read a paper and get the gist of it, 
right? Yeah. And be able to understand what is the new thing that's been discovered here? What is the new, you know, how does this fit into the framework of the other papers that are going on? And so if I can do it, you know, most people should be able to, uh, to be able to do it. So I've actually got to run now. Um, so I think we're kind of, we're already like 130, so we're already super late now. So I think we should probably wrap this up. Okay. Um, so thanks everybody <laughs> for, uh, for your questions and thanks for watching and sorry for the uh, technical snafus at the beginning. Uh, and we'll see you. I'm not sure if we're going to try and do another fill in recording this week. I think it's going to be pollen dependent. Pollen dependent. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll see what the pollen counts are. So thanks everybody for, uh, for joining us. Thanks Pamela for, uh, okay. for not sniffling too much and we'll see you all. Uh, we'll see you all next time. Sounds good.